can also, thanks Joe, I can also promise you that uh, this is a little bit of a Goldilocks tale. So depending on who you ask, Nancy Russell and the National Scenic Area went a little too far, or maybe they went a, not quite far enough, and then there's a handful of people who think they probably landed in a pretty good spot. And we are going to hear more about the Goldilocks tale of the National Scenic Area and Nancy Russell tonight with our guest, uh, Bowen Blair. And then following his talk, we'll have a chance for some Q&A. So th throughout the night, some things pop into your mind. Hang on to them, and we'll have a chance to learn a little bit more with your questions afterwards. Um, before I introduce tonight's guest, though, I want to take a minute and thank our sponsors, which is many of you in this audience, and to also thank you, if, all of you here, who have taken the time and made the time to come be together to learn about something new and hear from Bowen. And I don't know about you, but I feel like there is a sense that these opportunities to come together as real, live human beings and to spend more than five minutes or however many words you're allowed on Twitter, that those occasions sometimes seem more rare than they should be. I think they're still there, it just sometimes feels like that. And I don't know about you, but this kind of thing is one of my favorite things in the world. And so getting to do it every month with all of you and with people like Bowen or with Ralph Lampin last month with the Lamprey, that to me feels like one of the greatest gifts. And I hope that it feels like that for you as well. And if it does, I hope to see you each month. I hope you'll help us spread the word, and I hope you will do whatever you can to support our sponsors who, for 13 seasons, have made this lecture series happen. That's a really big deal. So thank you to all our sponsors, and thank you to you guys. Thank you. The other thing I want to tell you about is Mount Abs Institute. So Mount Abs Institute is a local nonprofit and they believe in figuring out ways to connect people to the natural world. And they do that through, through a variety of programs, including Sense of Place. They share that value with us. I'm imagining they share it with a lot of you. And if you don't, don't already know about them, I hope you take a moment and check them out at some point, because they are a local nonprofit doing that kind of work on a national level. And we're really lucky to have them here. Um, so tonight, I was talking with a friend of mine today. I was getting really nerdy about uh, land use planning and the National Scenic Area, which if you know me, these are the kinds of things that I actually want to talk about. And he made fun of me and told me, uh, welcome to the wild world of regional planning. And he can say that because he works in regional planning. And I, I took his note, his little jab, but it also reminded me that our speaker tonight has two very difficult challenges. The first is, as far as I can tell, there has never in the history of land use planning been a simple land use planning story. They are always complex. The second big challenge is that anytime you mention land use planning, you have the majority of your audience start to fall asleep. <laughs> so with those two challenges acknowledged, I will tell you, I have read the book, I have talked with Bowen, I know a tiny bit about this story. I'm excited to learn more. And uh, our guest, Bowen Blair, tonight is absolutely up to the task of sharing this incredible story with you. Uh, Bowen Blair is an attorney. He's a former executive director for Friends of the Columbia Gorge. He was senior vice president for the Trust for Public Lands. He has, in his career, been a part of hundreds of thousands of acres worth of decisions around public lands. And so he certainly has the qualifications to help share some of the story with us. Um, but most importantly for tonight, he knows how to tell a good story, and he has one hell of a main character. So please join me in welcoming Bowen Blair to Sense of Place, season 13. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank everyone for coming tonight. I was a little, little worried when he started talking about Goldilocks. I was thinking he might morph into the great bad wolf or something like that. And actually, I am going to do a nursery rhyme later on uh, in the presentation. But uh, thank you again for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So in 1980, Nancy Russell faced a dozen seemingly impossible challenges. 
including keeping the gorge entrances from being industrialized, stopping subdivisions on its most important lands, restoring the historic Columbia River Highway, especially the Mosier Twin Tunnels near us tonight for hiking and biking, and of course, passing federal legislation to protect the entire gorge. I'm gonna focus on just one of those challenges tonight, Russell's campaign to protect Cape Horn. Cape Horn typified many of her other battles, which required litigation or the threats of litigation, land acquisition, some by Russell herself, federal legislation, and constant unrelenting pressure on federal agencies and other public agencies. And like other challenges that Russell's faced, success was often temporary, defeat was usually permanent, and the outcome, well, that inevitably came down to the last second, time and again. Nancy Russell loved the Columbia Gorge. As a young mother, she and her children had explored its trails and vistas, and above all, its wildflowers. She connected with the gorge physically, emotionally, and intellectually. She put together a slideshow on the gorge's history and wildflowers for the Portland Garden Club, tracing the names of plants to the explorers and botanists they were named after, Clarkia, Luisia, Natali, and her presentations caught the eye of John Yon, a famous architect. In the summer of 1979, Jan invited Nancy and her husband, Bruce, to a picnic dinner at the Shire, his park-like property across from Multnomah Falls. Jan had been fighting for the gorge for 50 years, starting in the 1930s, when he authored two reports that highlighted its vulnerability and proposed solutions. But in 19, 1979, Jan was 69 years old and tiring. He wanted Russell to join his fight. She was eager to serve, but her role was unclear. She had no experience in politics, advocacy, or fundraising, but she loved the gorge, and she knew it backwards and forwards, and she had other important qualities. Russell had overcome adversity for much of her life. As a child of the Great Depression, her family moved 11 times in one five-year period, seeking housing that they could afford. A mother of, to five children, Russell would lose a son to meningitis, and later a daughter will, would struggle with mental illness. Tennis provided a release for Russell and gave insight into her character. She was, according to one professional, among the best women players in the nation. But unable to afford lessons as a child, she had lousy strokes. <laughs> she made up for this liability, though, through her focus and competitive nature. She ran every ball down, never seeding a point, even in warm-ups. I tell friends that I played with her for three years before she hit a ball to my forehand. <laughs> she sized up her opponent's weaknesses and consistently hit there. And she was always in motion, moving to net. Hit and go forward was her strategy. Hit and go forward. Months after she met John Yon, the National Park Service published a 300-page report that described the gorge as nationally significant and threatened. Don Clark, Multnomah County's executive, read the study and approached Cecil Landris, President Carter's Secretary of the Interior, who was born here in Hood River. Andrus promised action in Carter's second term. But Ronald Reagan won the election a few weeks later, so Clark called Oregon senior Senator Mark Hatfield. Hatfield chaired the Influential Appropriations Committee, which decides how federal funds are spent, and was one of the nation's most powerful and respected senators. He was cautious. But he promised if Clark built a strong, diverse coalition, by state, bipartisan, and on both sides of the Cascades, he would help. Clark asked his staff to find a leader for the campaign, and after some research, they also recommended Nancy Russell. When Russell started her fight for the gorge in 1980, the outlook was bleak. The first significant effort to protect the gorge had started 70 years earlier and reoccurred and failed every generation. A national park, including much of the gorge, was proposed in 1916. An interstate park was proposed by Jan in 1935. Separate Oregon and Washington Gorge Commissions were established in the 1950s, but were advisory only. And Jan proposed a national recreation area in 1970. The decade that began in 1980 was really the last chance to protect the gorge. The I-205 bridge was completed in 1982, bringing Skamania County's century-old farms 
high above the Columbia in the riverfront lands between Cape Horn and Beacon Rock within a short commute of downtown Portland. All these lands were in private ownership and unzoned, again, unzoned, except for a sliver of Clark County at the entrance to the gorge that included the thousand acre Steigerwald Lake wetlands, which were zoned for heavy industry. Only federal legislation could protect a two state area as large and complex as the gorge, provide funding for public parks at the scale needed, and permanently protect the farms and ranches threatened by suburban creep. But President Reagan, both governors, five out of the six gorge counties, and most of the gorge's 41,000 residents opposed legislation. And soon Secretary of Interior James Watt would place a moratorium on the federal purchase of parkland. Then he proposed selling off 35 million acres of federal land. The heart of the resistance to federal legislation came from Skamania County. This made sense, as the bulk of the private land in the county lay between the river and the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, and this land would be most impacted by legislation. Culturally, the county was anti-government. Skamania's economy was based on logging, even though this dependence caused unemployment levels of up to 30% during winters and recessions. And while there was little commercial timber in the gorge, timber companies and many of their employees resented the federal government telling them how to log. Even local regulations were disliked by residents who believed in the words of one of their commissioners that God has zoned the gorge, referring to the winter storms and ice that regularly blanketed the area. Skamania County's leadership decided to fight and hired Chuck Cushman, an anti-government crusader who enjoyed his nickname, Rent a Riot. Cushman quickly traveled the length of the gorge with a stark message. A national scenic area would destroy residents' lives. 15,000 families, virtually everyone in the gorge, would be relocated. He called the National Park Service Nazis and gorge legislation the final solution. Not surprising, it was in Skamania County where two of the most destructive development proposals arose. In October 1980, a small-time developer, George Reiser, bulldozed roads for his 24-lot subdivision directly across from Multnomah Falls. State regulations required notices and hearings when a parcel was divided into five or more lots, but Reiser avoided this requirement by short platting his land, a time-honored tradition in Skamania and Klickitat counties where developers divided their land into four lots, transferred the lots to friends and relatives, who then divided their lots into another four lots, and so on. Riser subdivision would create the largest concentration of people in the 20 miles between Skamania Landing and Washougal, all with no notice and no hearing. Cape Horn is just downriver from Riser subdivision. Almost a square mile in size, its plateau rises 1,300 feet above the Columbia. There were no public lands on Cape Horn, Mount Pleasant, or Mount Zion, and none on the shoreline upriver to Beacon Rock. So no public trails or access to the river. In fact, the Park Service's report had revealed that Washington had only four miles of trails in the entire gorge. Russell's vision was to create a park at Cape Horn that mirrored Crown Point across the river where Vista House stood, but others had different plans. Six months after Riser created a subdivision, another developer used short plats to form Rimview Estates, a 16-lot subdivision on the Cape Horn Plateau. So one of Washington's most recognized landmarks was now subdivided with no notice and no hearing. The lots were long and narrow, running through pastures and wildflowers to the edge of the cliff, offering spectacular views upriver to Beacon Rock. Russell did not have the resources to fight both subdivisions and promote legislation. She chose to fight Riser because it only required litigation, legislation, and the purchase of a single property. She recruited plaintiffs, hired an attorney, funded a $50,000 bond, and six months later won her lawsuit. But it was a temporary victory, as all Riser had to do was to refile as a subdivision and follow minimum state regulations. Meanwhile, Rimview Estate's short-platted lots were selling for up to $50,000 apiece. With litigation offering only a temporary respite, Russell contacted the Trust for Public Land. 
and TPL is a national nonprofit whose mission is to place key private lands in the public ownership for parks and wildlife refuges and to protect working ranches and farms and their landscapes with conservation easements. As a private organization, TPL can quickly secure land, unlike public agencies, which usually have to follow a long, cumbersome process. And unlike the Nature Conservancy, TPL does not own land long term. It options to target property, then lobbies for public funding, so a public agency can buy the land from TPL. In 1980, Russell met the head of TPL's Western region, Harriet Burgess, at the Shire. Harriet was a former congressional staffer. She knew Congress as well as Russell knew the Gorge, and the two women soon uh, formed a very close bond. But with no agencies buying land in the Gorge, especially in Washington, and with no public funding, TPL would need to buy and hold the land in the hope that federal legislation would pass, opening it up to more risk than it had ever faced before. In late 1982, Russell and the Friends Board hired me as executive director. I would oversee the Friends' uh, response to development, lobby Congress, and negotiate the terms of the legislation, and work with national conservation groups and the media. My work would free Russell, who remained involved in lobbying and held critical congressional relationships, to spend more time on building the Friends and funding and guiding TPL's land acquisition, which was essential if the Gorge was gonna be protected. Russell quickly built a formidable campaign and organization. She took politicians, supporters, and prospective donors into the Gorge every day, regaling her targets, and I think they were really captive audiences, with the Gorge's importance and its increasing threats. The tours were often one-on-one, -on -one, but soon she was taking large groups, often women's or conservation organizations, on extended outings, asking them to endorse the Friends legislation and write their representatives. In addition to her tours, Russell started the Friends annual hiking weekend, believing that the more people saw the gorge, the more they would be interested in protecting her. Before long, over a thousand hikers were participating, enjoying nature and listening to pitches to join the Friends and write Congress. If prospects couldn't make it out to the gorge, Russell brought the gorge to them. She raised the funds for and helped write a compelling multimedia production, Who Was Watching, that celebrated earlier protection efforts and asked who was now looking out for the gorge. Russell would typically spend the morning and early afternoon touring the gorge with potential supporters, return home to Portland by 3 p.m. to write letters and make uh, phone calls, cook dinner for Bruce and there are now four children, and then lug 30 pounds of audiovisual equipment to an evening presentation of who was watching. Back home by 10, she would start all over again early the next morning. Russell's work and passion for the Gorge inspired others and built critical relationships, including one with Senator Hatfield. Their relationship formed at Steigerwald Lake, the thousand acre wetlands at the Gorge's western entrance that was owned for heavy industry. Steigerwald's landowners had just received a permit to clear cut 1,200 year old cottonwood trees essential habitat for bald eagles and herons, but an obstacle to industrialization. After marathon negotiations, Burgess optioned the property, and at Russell's request, Hatfield orchestrated an emergency appropriation of eight and a half million dollars to buy the land. Almost overnight, Washington's Western Gorge entrance went from a certain fate of factory smoke, smokestacks and parking lots to a national wildlife refuge the first of three that Nancy would help create. Nancy's admiration for Senator Hatfield grew as she heard him speak about his faith and philosophy. Nobody owns land, he said. We are only stewards for future generations. And Senator Hatfield was impressed by Nancy Russell. And at a time when conservationists were concerned about his ties to the timber industry, her vocal support was appreciated by the senator. Meanwhile, in October 1983, Skamania County unanimously approved Riser's revamped subdivision. With Friends of the Gorge ready to litigate again, Riser held a press conference to unexpectedly announce that TPL had acquired his property, even though no public agency or public funding yet existed for TPL to resell it. I feel like George climbed down off the limb, Harriet told a reporter, and I've climbed onto it. 
just downriver, a quarter of the lots at Rimview Estates on Cape Horn had sold, and the friends received an anonymous tip that a large house was being built 50 feet from the rim. The owner was Ed Cleveland, and Ed Cleveland rarely did things in a modest way. His four-acre property included a two-story, 6,000-square-foot residence, a 4,000-square-foot barn with attached apartment, a garage, several outbuildings, and a bomb shelter with five years of food. <laughs> when it was completed, the house was visible for miles upriver, even at night. It nagged at Russell as she drove the gorge each day, reminding her of what she had been unable to prevent. By 1986, thanks to Russell's daily tours and nightly presentations, the Friends had grown rapidly. It had offices in Portland and Seattle and a full-time staff of four, a robust hiking weekend program with 1,500 hikers and 32 organizations participating, a membership of almost 4,000 people. The Friends litigation was also paying dividends as it defeated Hidden Harbor, Skamania County's largest subdivision yet, approved for 83 residential lots and a marina on 78 acres downriver from Beacon Rock. All of this progress, however, had put a bullseye on Russell's back. Save the Gorge from Nancy Russell bumper stickers appeared everywhere. A widely disseminated nursery rhyme, not Goldilocks, based on the house that Jack built, depicted Russell as the lady that spotted the flowers behind the house that Jack built, which led to Jack's house being condemned by a surly, cigar-chomping Smokey the Bear. <laughs> this is a true story, the last page warned. It hasn't happened here yet, but only you can prevent a national scenic area. <laughs> Other opposition was more threatening. A local candidate for sheriff ran political ads warning that Nancy Russell wants us to disappear. At a congressional hearing in Stevenson, her tires were slashed. Soon she would receive death threats. But Russell just kept her focus, hit and go forward, hit and go forward. TPL, meanwhile, was on the brink of financial disaster in the gorge and needed legislation to pass quickly. By 1986, it had conveyed 11 properties valued at over $9 million into public ownership, thanks to Senator Hatfield. But the organization that rarely owned land now held 15 properties valued at over $4 million an amount that exceeded the organization's entire annual operating budget. And it had another four properties totaling 600 acres under option. Most of these properties were located in Skamania County. If federal legislation failed, the trust would be forced to resell its properties for pennies on the dollar, a financial and reputational disaster. TPL's board was concerned. To address the risk and to enable TPL to buy more land, Nancy and Bruce Russell took out bank loans at substantial interest rates that they then lent to TPL at no interest. They made their first interest-free loan of $200,000 in 1984 so TPL could buy the St. Cloud Ranch just downriver from Beacon Rock. A year later, they borrowed another $200,000 to help TPL buy the first conservation easement in the gorge over a Mount Pleasant property. But TPL's position was still precarious and TPL's board was planning to withdraw from the gorge. Russell contacted Senator Hatfield and asked him to send a letter to the board. She would write the letter for the senator, she said. Hatfield agreed, and the day before their meeting, the board received the letter. That you have favored the Columbia Gorge with such a generous quota of your resources during the last few years, Russell wrote for the senator, I assure you has not gone unnoticed by me. The message that TPL's most important appropriator was watching their actions in the gorge was received, and Burgess continued her high-risk work. At Riverview Estates, meanwhile, four of the 16 lots had been sold to private properties, and two of those had been developed, including Ed Cleveland's sprawling residence. Burgess had been negotiating in vain with the subdivision's owners for the 12 unsold lots until the Russells made their third no-interest loan to TPL this time for $300,000. Using that loan, TPL was able to buy and hold the 12 lots still owned by the developer. By the summer of 1986, however, the act, the only source of funds to allow the federal government to buy more land from TPL, seemed doomed. Contentious hearings had come and gone, including one where Ed Cleveland had flown cross-country 
to oppose the legislation. Cord's legislation had received national publicity with articles in the New York Times and Chicago Tribune and a scathing guest editorial in the Wall Street Journal predicting a population exodus in the gorge if legislation passed. Conservative Republicans united to defeat a bill that they felt imposed unconstitutional federal restrictions over private property. Their delay tactic stopped the bill in both House committees as a congressional, a congressional session was ending, after which the entire process would have to start over. But the session was unexpectedly extended by a week, then two, and in a remarkable turn of events, the Rules Committee, which was not supposed to meet in the sessions last week, met twice to consider the gorge. At a contentious midnight meeting with 48 hours remaining in the session, Rules bypassed the other committees and sent the bill to the full House, where after four hours of vitriolic debate, it passed 290 to 91. Over in the Senate, now on the session's last full day, Senator Hatfield asked for unanimous consent to pass the House bill. Unanimous consent is a process used for uncontroversial matters. <laughs> and Gord's legislation, as you know, was anything but. Like their House counterparts, several senators despised the legislation, and if only one objected, the bill would die. But unwilling to anger Senator Hatfield, no one objected and Gorge legislation passed unanimously. Proponents were ecstatic, but they knew that President Reagan had 30 days to approve the bill or it would die of a pocket veto. President Reagan disliked almost everything the National Scenic Area Act stood for. His aversion was reinforced by formal veto recommendations from three cabinet officers representing Interior Justice and the Office of Management and Budget. Skamania County declared a week-long mourning period, flew the flag at half-staff, <laughs> and used the 30 days to launch a vigorous letter-writing and lobbying campaign urging a veto. The White House was silent for 10 days, then 20. On the evening of the 29th day, President Reagan called Senator Hatfield at home to tell him he would, indeed, veto the legislation. I understand, Antoinette Atfield overheard her husband tell the president, you do what you have to do. And then he said, and I'll do what I have to do. He reminded the president that his budget for the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars to its detractors, would soon be coming before the Appropriations Committee. The next morning, just hours before the bill would die, President Reagan signed the Gorge legislation. <laughs> into law with his right hand, according to Senator Hatfield, while holding his nose with his left. <laughs> Russell could now focus her attention on land acquisition. She had always been a bit skeptical about land use regulations at the county level, feeling that the system favored developers and believed that public ownership of land was a more permanent solution. For the first time, especially on the Washington side of the gorge, there would be money to acquire land as the act authorized up to $40 million for land purchases. By the end of 1987, the Forest Service had spent over $4 million to purchase 3,000 acres in the gorge, most of it owned by TPL, including the 12 undeveloped Rimview Estate lots. TPL accelerated its buying spree and by the mid-1990s had optioned two critical properties owned by the Grams and McKellar families. These lands ran for several miles from Mount Pleasant to Cape Horn, from river to rim, and had been marked 60 years earlier for purchase by John Yon. The northernmost section of the McKellar Track joined Rimview Estate's southern lots, connecting the Cape Horn Plateau to the river. Russell successfully urged Senator Hatfield to appropriate the necessary funds, and the properties were conveyed to the Forest Service. By now, Russell had inspired and guided TPL's purchase of a dozen properties around Cape Horn in green on the map, totaling 500 acres. Cape Horn also became a top priority for the Forest Service, which independently bought dozens of smaller properties, including the two remaining undeveloped lots in Rimview Estates. Of Rimview Estates' original 16 lots, 14 were now owned by the Forest Service. Only two, both of which had been developed, including the large Cleveland house, remained in private ownership. 
At this time, Russell befriended Dan Huntington, an avid hiker who had moved to the Northwest in 1987 after reading about the National Scenic Area. Seeing that the act had actually increased property values, Huntington quit his job as a financial broker in Portland, moved to the Cape Horn area, and became a realtor, and then cornered the local market. He later acknowledged that his real estate practice often was a front for his advocacy efforts. <laughs> Huntington was the first to recognize that if a handful of additional properties could be bought, the Cape Horn Plateau would support a new trail, perhaps four miles long, that would offer incomparable views upriver and of Oregon's public lands as well. This would by itself double the trail mileage that the Park Service had inventoried on the entire Washington side of the gorge. The new trail would start near a 42 acre property that TPL had bought at Huntington's encouragement, climb to the Cape Horn Plateau, skirt Rimview Estates two developed lots, and descend over the Evergreen Highway to the trail's terminus an 80-foot high waterfall on the McKellar property. Russell soon found, however, that public ownership wasn't a sure bet as challenges arose on some already protected properties. In 1995, the Forest Service considered selling, subject to a conservation easement, Rimview Estates' southern four lots to generate revenue. Ed Cleveland, who owned the adjacent lot, would surely be the buyer, further entrenching an opponent to Russell's proposed park. So Russell wrote a diplomatic letter to the Forest Service explaining the history of Cape Horn and, of course, copied her letter to Senator Hatfield. To its credit, the Forest Service decided not to proceed. At the same time, the Forest Service declined to buy a 10-acre parcel that adjoined Rimview Estates on the west because the property had no special resources. Russell was a practical person, however. She bought me an ironing board for my 30th birthday. <laughs> And she knew that great parks needed parking lots and restrooms, preferably placed on less valuable land. She reminded the Forest Service of her vision for a major park, and the agency reassessed and bought the land. The next year in 1996, a greater challenge arose at Cape Horn. The National Scenic Area's boundaries generally extended only to the rim, and with no room for a trail on Cape Horn's sheer cliff, a portion of the trail had to be placed outside the National Scenic Area and a portion in the general management area managed by the Gorge Commission, where the Forest Service rarely bought land. Huntington approached the Forest Service about these parcels, but citing their policy not to buy land outside the National Scenic Area or in the general management areas, it declined. TPL also declined, citing the high financial risk and low chance of getting these lands into public ownership. Even Nancy Russell, with her higher tolerance for risk, declined. Then Huntington met with Dave Kennard, the former vice chair of the Friends of the Gorge and later of the Gorge Commission. Kennard wanted to help, but was pretty naive about politics. He cashed out his retirement fund and believing that his friend's background would cause Skamania County to oppose his project, formed a corporate shield, the Cape Horn Land and Timber Company. Sarah, apologies here because this is land use complications, but bear with me. So he formed the LLC and brought, bought the properties, which bought the properties and hid his involvement. The park and trail were soon endorsed by several Skamania County-based agencies and received qualified support from the county commission. It turned out that Huntington had secured a very good purchase price for Kennard's LLC, and to his surprise, the LLC offered the lands that it had bought for less than half a million dollars to the Forest Service for their full appraised value, one and a half million dollars. Then all hell broke loose. <laughs> Kennard revealed to an acquaintance that he was behind the LLC and word got back to Washington Senator Slade Gorton. Senator Hatfield had retired the year before and Gorton was now the Appropriation Committee's most important member from the Northwest. Gorton issued a scathing press release saying that the profit sought by Kennard was astounding and accusing him of blatant profiteering. Huntington's carefully crafted coalition collapsed. Skamania County agencies withdrew their support and Huntington resigned as a trustee of the LLC. Huntington turned to Russell for advice. She told him to donate to Gorton's campaign. 
Soon, Huntington had bundled $50,000 for Gorton's campaign and was invited to a meeting with the senator and his largest contributors. Gorton seemed appreciative that Huntington represented broader public interests, so he worked with him to create the trail without enriching Kennard. Huntington proposed that Kennard's GMA land become special management area land, making it eligible for purchase, yet limiting how much it could be developed. He further suggested that much of Kennard's land outside the National Scenic Area be included in a new special purchase unit, and that Kennard donate some of his land to the Forest Service. Gorton agreed, and five years later, Kennard sold most of his land to the Forest Service for far less than its value. Huntington next secured a listing on 12 acres of Jack Collins' property that he also had included in the special purchase unit. This parcel connected Kennard's properties to Rimview Estates, and Huntington persuaded the Columbia Land Trust, a new organization to Cape Horn, to buy the parcel in 1999. At his encouragement, the Columbia Land Trust then bought a 13-acre hiking easement over another critical property in the GMA near the trailhead. One of the challenges that Russell faced was that public agencies rarely bought land that was developed. Houses were expensive to tear down, and raising them, even though they were purchased from willing landowners, played into Chuck Cushman's enduring narrative of forced depopulation. TPL didn't, mind, TPL didn't mind controversy, but the finances were challenging. If it bought property for one and a half million dollars and then tore down a million dollar house, it would lose a million dollars in value plus costs when it sold the bare property to the Forest Service. But Russell didn't mind controversy or losing money. So in 1999, she bought one of the two improved Rimview Estate lots, tore down its house, reseeded the bare land, and sold the lot to the Forest Service three years later, losing $30,000. The same year that Russell sold her Rimview Estate property, now without its house, to the Forest Service, she, ever practical, bought another property across from the proposed trailhead for hikers to use as a parking lot. The same year, sorry, a year later in 2003, one of Huntington's fellow trail builders discovered that from above the McKellar waterfall, he could hike down to the Columbia River and join up with a country lane that led back to the trailhead. So instead of an eight mile out and back trail, they could create a seven mile loop. Except later that day, later that year, a hiking group was confronted by landowners who announced that the trail trespassed their land for a few hundred feet. Huntington met with the landowners who disliked the Friends, disliked the Forest Service, and didn't care much about public recreation, especially when it was on their land. After several unproductive meetings, Huntington offered $100,000 for an easement, and their opposition melted away. It was easier to raise $100,000, Huntington figured, than to find another way around Cape Horn. A foundation created by the Russells after Bruce Russell's death paid for the easement, by 2004, the Forest Service TPL and the Columbia Land Trust had purchased 35 properties at or adjacent to Cape Horn, and most of the plateau's four-mile-long ridge was now publicly owned. That spring, Russell was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a terminal illness with a life expectancy of only a few years. Over the course of those years, Russell would progressively weaken using a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, and then a motorized chair until she was confined to bed. But she would keep working on gorge issues, especially Cape Horn. The seven mile Cape Horn Loop Trail was now entirely in Forest Service or nonprofit ownership, but neither Russell nor Huntington was satisfied. While hikers could now enjoy Washington's premier trail in the gorge, they had to detour several hundred yards inland from the rim for half a mile to avoid private property owned by the Collins family and Ed Cleveland. With her health failing and the real estate market rising, Russell asked Huntington to negotiate an option for her on the second Collins property, 36 acres, a modest home, two barns, and world-class views for $2 million. Russell pledged a million dollars and friend staff soon raised the other million from a Seattle businessman who had long admired Russell. 
With the Collins property secured, Russell set her eyes on the last property needed to build a perfect trail, Ed Cleveland's estate to the south. Over the years, Russell had pressed TPL to buy the Cleveland house. TPL was willing, but harbored little hope of success because Ed Cleveland had not wanted to sell. And even if he did, the cost of buying the property would be prohibitive since the large expensive house would have to be torn down and its value could not be recouped in a sale to the Forest Service. In 1996, TPL met with Cleveland, but he wanted double the property's value. In 2004, Cleveland listed his property at one and a half million dollars, but TPL's appraisers believed the fair market value was under a million. Russell, by now almost a year after her ALS diagnosis, called TPL regularly to offer encouragement and to stress the property's importance. In 2005, Cleveland rejected a $1.35 million offer from another buyer. But with this new evidence, TPL offered 1.4 million, but Cleveland said no. A year earlier, Russell had created a new land trust within the Friends to ensure that Gorge Lands would continue to be bought after her death. So now a new strategy was hatched. If TPL could option the property, it would transfer this right to the land trust, which would raise the house, replant the property, and absorb the million dollar loss in a sale to the Forest Service. So, so TPL offered Cleveland one and a half million dollars. Cleveland agreed, and the property was placed under contract. Except, two weeks later, Cleveland filed for bankruptcy, almost certainly killing the deal. He had $21 million in assets, it turned out, $35 million in liabilities, and over 60 creditors. The land trust attorney advised it to look for other properties. But there were no properties as important as this one, and after several months of persuasion by attorneys for TPL and the Friends, the bankruptcy judge approved the purchase. Even as her health deteriorated, Russell spent time working on Gorge issues through 2006 and 2007. She discovered that Skamania County, which 20 years earlier had fought her under the banner of private property rights, had been using her Cape Horn Trailhead property as a park and ride facility without her permission. Instead of getting angry, Russell asked Huntington to negotiate a below market sale of the property to the county, conditioned upon the county implementing $14,000 of trailhead related improvements. By now, Russell was using a BiPAP machine to help her breathe and had been confined to her bedroom for almost a year. One fall morning in 2008, she woke up and asked to visit the gorge. Her nurses said it would take a few days to arrange. No, Russell insisted, she wanted to go that afternoon. So calls were made, and just before 3 p.m., Russell, on a gurney, was loaded into the back of an ambulance with her nurses, and they set off for the gorge, followed by her son, Aubrey, and grandson, Everett. Their first stop was Cape Horn. By now, the Friends Land Trust had torn down the main house and torn it down to its foundation, and for the first time in a quarter of a century, Russell had an unimpeded view upriver. To those of us who knew Nancy, it was not surprising that she convinced the ambulance drivers to carry her down a steep deer trail at the edge of the cliff to where Cleveland's gazebo had stood and where her view was even better. <laughs> Russell was clearly enjoying herself. This had been the property after all that had demonstrated to her continual displeasure why her campaign had been needed year after year for a quarter of a century. Cleveland's house was the first one built at Rimview Estates, an illegal 16-lot subdivision. Ed Cleveland had opposed the legislation and would oppose Russell's vision of a large park to mirror Crown Point. The Russell's third interest-free loan for $300,000 had allowed TPL to buy 12 of the lots and sell them to the Forest Service. Eight years later, she had to stop the Forest Service from selling four of these lots to Cleveland for a private pasture. And four years after that, she bought the subdivision's other developed property, raised its house, and sold the empty lot to the Forest Service, losing $30,000 in the process. Her, her fundraising had been needed, so the land trust 
which she almost single-handedly had created, could then raise Cleveland's house and outbuildings, sell the property to the Forest Service at a substantial loss, and ultimately put the Cape Horn Trail where it belonged. It had required endless pressure, endlessly applied, as National Audubon's Brock Evans was fond of saying. Russell's ambulance continued up the gorge, making brief stops at Beacon Rock, Major Creek, and McCall Point, visiting places that she had helped acquire, either through the Trust for Public Land or on her own. TPL would end up acquiring 90 properties, close to 20,000 acres, in the National Scenic Area, and Nancy and Bruce Russell would add another 30 properties, almost 1,000 acres, for public enjoyment. At 9.30 that evening, the ambulance returned Russell to her home, where, 16 days later, she died at age 76. Three years after her death, a large crowd gathered to dedicate the Cape Horn Overlook where Ed Cleveland's gazebo had stood. A landscape architect, Doug Macy, had created a modest basalt overlook. And while the overlook was never formally named, guidebooks and newspapers, hikers and locals too, call it the Nancy Russell Overlook. Thank you all very much. All right, thank you, Joe, for bringing up some lights there. Okay, while well, you guys think about um, what questions you may have, um, I want to get started just with a personal question that you were, I think the book said you were 28 when you first got hired. Sorry yeah. to give away your age, if you do the math. Quite but, all right, sir. Um, was... and, and now it's f almost yeah. four decades later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fabulous 37, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm curious what, what you now, knowing what you do and what you've gone through, what would you say to the 28-year-old kid who was starting down this path? Oh, do it. Do it <laughs> in a heartbeat. You know, I, I had a friend who read the book, and she, uh, Ann Squire, who used to uh, head up LCDC and headed up the Gorge Commission, and she said it really shouldn't have had to have been so hard. And I think that's probably what I would have told myself, that it is gonna be incredibly hard, and it's gonna seem time and time again, I just, again, talked about Cape Horn tonight, but there were a dozen other transactions or trying to get legislation passed or through committee that always came down to the last second and seemed like we were gonna fail. And it, we were able to prevail almost every single time. So I would just, I guess my advice would be, do what Nancy Russell did, be persistent, be tenacious, and hopefully things will work out. Like it. All right. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, and I will come track you down. Um, and I also, well, let's see. All the way back there. Um, while we're walking up here, I have to say, I, uh, Bowen knows that I read his book on my phone for a lot of it. And the, the first chunk of it is fantastic, regardless where you stand on the National Scenic Act. If you, if you want to know some good background about the gorge, everyone should read this book. So, all right. Thank you, Sarah. I'm amazed your eyes aren't crossed from reading yeah. it on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> and that you could see me way up here. Um, could, Joe, could we maybe turn up the house lights a little bit? Is that possible? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bowen. That was uh, fascinating. I have so many questions. But my first one was, um, I can tell that this fight took a lot of political capital, right? And, and also um, encountered lots of um, community opposition. And I'm curious, in the 80s and 90s, if there were community meetings ever, conversations in, in counties in the scenic area, um, or conversations with the Columbia River Treaty tribes about um, that, that vision um, to see if there was alignment or you know, to kind of problem solve together. Yeah, you, there were. There were a lot of community meetings uh, when the legislation was introduced uh, early on. I was talking with Sarah about this earlier. Uh, earlier on, Sarah was asking, is there some way we could have done this and kind of lowered the temperature. And uh, I told her that Nancy in particular early on, and then I ended up going to a lot of community meetings. And what we found 
particularly on the Washington side, and, and this was very different from the Washington side because there wasn't statewide land use planning. There were more private lands that were buildable on the Washington side. So I understand some of it, but we just couldn't have a dialogue. And a lot of it was because Chuck Cushman had come through and said, you're all gonna be thrown out of your houses if the legislation passes. And people were really genuinely scared. And we would, uh, again, I was telling Sarah, we would show people the, the language in our legislation that said, if you have a single family house and you're using it the way you did before the act passed, you can't be condemned. And Cushman would respond, well, you can always change the laws. So there was never, a, a, I felt, an honest dialogue. Uh, the tribes you asked about, the tribes were very involved. They, uh, particularly their land holdings in the Eastern Gorge and their ancestral lands that were in private ownership. I'm thinking Miller Island and Lyle Point, uh, two critical properties for the tribes. Both were burial grounds. Uh, Miller Island, there was mining going on. Uh, Lyle Point was approved for about, I think, 40 houses. The developer even put a bridge in, put the infrastructure in. We were able to acquire it at TPL, and we ended up holding it for, I think, eight or 10 years. It was just really difficult. So the tribes were very interested, were very supportive, and we had a lot of conversations and alliances with them. But we were never able to really bridge the gap with Skamania County. And it's a shame because I, I think the leadership at that time, and leadership's completely different now, but the leadership at that time wanted to fight, and they wanted to hire Cushman, ran a riot, and he did that, and he did that very effectively. Uh, at least it was effective at the local level. When it got back to Congress, you know, it was really counterproductive because he would say things that the senators would know were just absolutely wrong. So, you know, it was difficult to kind of have uh, a discussion at that point. The point I want to come back to, though, is the average Skamania County resident, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, wasn't that invested until Cushman came with a fight. I, they wanted a rural lifestyle, a lifestyle that they saw as, you know, they could do on their land what they wanted, and their neighbor maybe could do the same thing, too. And they were, they were free from what they saw as kind of the urban problems of crime and congestion and maybe progressive values. But uh, that life was disappearing. And it was disappearing because the interstate bridge had gone in and all those lands were unzoned and would have been developed mostly with second homes or you know, commuting estates. So that life was disappearing. And, and I would argue the National Scenic Area Act actually addressed their concerns better than their leadership was at the time, so. All right, yes. Hi, Bowen. Um, uh, hey, Peter. Yeah, hey, um, so you, you spent a lot of time in DC negotiating, and can you tell us a little bit about that, and, and, why, and also why didn't James Watt have his way in tank this thing? Uh, James Watt didn't have his way because he said some racist things that got him thrown out of office. Will you tell us who James Watt is? Uh, he was the Secretary of Interior at Thanks. that point. And, and he was dead set against any new federal units. Uh, he wanted to sell off, as I mentioned, federal land. Uh, he put a moratorium on the acquisition of parkland. So, and you're right, Peter, I would, would spend a couple of months at a time back in DC and uh, negotiating with staff over language. But my negotiations meant nothing if Nancy wasn't building 4,000 pretty angry people that the gorge was being lost on their watch. Uh, you know, they're, they're great stories. The, I talked before how everything went down to the last moment, but uh, at the end of the session, when you had conservative Republicans trying to draw out the clock, uh, they were successful. And Gord's legislation would not have passed if the session wasn't delayed over issues that were completely unrelated, first a week, then two weeks. And we were able to pass it then on the very last day of the extended session. 
And at one point, Congressman Weaver told me after the clock was run out on the Interior Committee, that's it. You, have, you should go home. There's nothing you can do. So I made arrangements, was sitting in the, uh, you know, at the airport waiting for my flight when I got a call from his staff saying, everything's changed. The Rules Committee has agreed to meet at midnight tonight. And even though the Rules Committee never met in the last week of the session, but they met, and they met twice for the gorge, so. Thank you, sir. Um, can, you, can you hear me, Bon? Yeah, Jurgen, uh, I can't see you, but I can hear your <laughs> voice, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Bowen, that was fantastic. Um, you know, in my small booklet, um, A View from the Front Lines, I have the opinion about the Park Service versus the Forest Service. And of course, I'm very biased. <clears throat> um, now, 35 years later, where do you stand? What's your opinion? Looking back, uh, what's your thought about that? I think it's a discussion that we should have. Uh, the, the National Park Service uh, was not able to manage to be a partner with the commission for a handful of reasons. The first was Chuck Cushman, you know, coming out saying they're Nazis, they're gonna throw you off your land. The second was Senator Hatfield, who legislation never would have passed without him. But he didn't really like the Park Service. He was much more comfortable with the Forest Service. Oregon is a Forest Service state, it's not a national park state. And you had the Interior Department, which the National Park Service is part of, uh, oppose legislation. You had James Watt as Secretary of Interior, then Don Hotel. So all those things mitigated against it. The National Park Service was absolutely not going to happen in 1986. All those have changed right now. And as you look at the major issues confronting the gorge, whether it's climate change or as population growth in the metro area, and coming out and uh, uh, more people using the gorge, more risk of fire, more overuse, that sort of thing. And you look at the two agencies, you know, the Park Service has more experience in managing people than the Forest Service does. So I, I think it's a discussion worth having. I think that uh, the Forest Service in many ways has done a, a very good job I think particularly some of your work early on with the management plan. I think uh, some of the land acquisition work, but that land acquisition was driven by TPL to a large extent. So I think it's a conversation worth happening, uh, worth having, excuse me. I think the situation has really changed. Hi, Bowen. Hello, Chris. <laughs> so Chris um, was uh, with me at Trust for Public Land was involved in negotiating the protection of Lyle Point. So what would, should happen now? What, from, what would Nancy want to be happening now? What would you, in retrospect, but also looking forward, what, what pieces aren't there? Do we have enough trails? We've bought all this land. Are there, are, has the, I, my sense of we haven't been building trails nearly fast enough to get access to these lands and how do we, as a community, figure that piece of it out, or maybe you have other things that you think we ought to be doing um, to enhance the scenic area. Well, I think overuse, as I mentioned, is a huge issue confronting the national scenic area. And whether it happens in the next, I mean, it's happening now. You look at popular places like Oneota Gorge, Dog Mountain, certain times, the historic Columbia River Highway on a summer weekend, I mean, you have people parking all over the place. Uh, the Eagle Creek Fire, I mean, that was, if there had been more monitoring of trails, if trails had been closed down during high fire season, I think that sort of thing, that has to happen. Climate change is an enormous issue. I'm very concerned, and if I lived in the gorge, I'd be even more concerned about another conflagration. Uh, the gorge in some places is drying out, if you get another fire caused by the railroad and you have a 40 mile an hour wind, that could be catastrophic. So we've got to address, and, and I think the Gorge Commission, 
is, has done a good job uh, with climate change. I think it's, it hasn't been that involved with the overuse, recreation overuse now. I think the other big issue facing us is monitoring and enforcement. And uh, that's just not being done. You look at approvals of houses dating back to the late 1980s, houses were approved subject to screening going on, going in by trees or berms. And by now it's been 40 years and you've had many properties that have changed ownership. And nobody has gone back, not the counties, not the commission, to see if those conditions are being upheld 40 years later. And I'm, I'm confident they're not. And when I was on the Gorge Commission, we had a, a fair amount of testimony that they weren't. To its credit, the Gorge Commission is moving forward with looking at a monitoring study. Uh, they're taking Klickitat County right now where they have essentially planning authority and going back and seeing, okay, have conditions been complied with? But it's got to happen. And then they'll make a decision about the rest of the, uh, the other five counties once that report comes out. But I, I can tell you from personal experience that we've got to do a better job of monitoring and enforcing when there isn't compliance. It's required by the act, it's required by the management plan, but it's not being done. I'm curious at that point, because one of the things that I've heard in talking with folks about this is that, that as part of the act, there was funding included, but that the reality of that coming and playing out through time has it hasn't really developed to the extent that the act promised it yes yes and no okay I mean, it there was a lot of money authorized in the act and then it has to be appropriated the land acquisition money was driven by the trust for public land so that that authorized i think it was 40 million dollars and that's been spent and more than that uh, the act authorized $10 million to build a conference center and a, an interpretive center. The Discovery Center and yeah. Skamania Lodge. And Skamania Lodge. And those have been built. And Skamania County went, when I was starting in 1982, it had, I think, a single motel down by the waterfront that had four rooms, maybe. And it had no tourist facilities whatsoever. And Skamania Lodge, the year it was bought, it was uh, the year it was built, excuse me, was the largest private employer in the county. So it, it's made a huge difference. So that money was spent. The interpretive money was spent too. There was another $10 million set aside for economic development. That has not all been appropriated. And I so that and so that's 40 years now. Yes. So what's the holdup? I, it's all politics. Okay. Yeah. And and it's forming coalitions and getting that money. There are appropriators who serve uh, from the Northwest on the Appropriations Committee. It can be done, but it, you've got to put together a broad-based coalition to get that money. And if you do, I think you can get a lot more than $10 million. And there was another $10 million set aside for recreation facilities. I think a lot of that, if not all of it, has been appropriated. 3 million, 2.8 million for the historic Columbia River Highway, the Mosier Twin Tunnels, that used the 2.8 million. So if you, if you combine them, there was way more than $30 million authorized by the Act for economic development. Most of that has been appropriated. But there's still, I don't know if it's $4 million or what for economic development, and there's more of that available. I know there's people in this audience who are building these coalitions, right? So where's the focal point for that money? Who, who has the responsibility with the millions of requests that come in throughout the nation, throughout the Forest Service, throughout the Department of the Interior for money to do things? Where does the little secret for us in the, in the gorge here, are we like 500th yeah. on the list or? Yeah. Well, it depends. Where's the priority set? It depends what the, the source of funds is, but if it's a traditional economic development money, the 10 million that was authorized in the legislation, you know, maybe 6 million of that's been appropriated, I'm not sure. But if it's that money, that the decisions are made by economic development councils that both states set up 
50 years ago. And those councils have not been very involved with the Gorge. The Gorge Commission uh, reviews their decisions, but essentially they don't have a lot of authority to either uh, not approve them. The Gorge Commission essentially is tasked with saying, is this inconsistent with the act? And if it's not inconsistent, then they'll approve it. So it's these economic development councils that, as I recall, have the, the primary authority for deciding how the money is going to be spent. Now, that's just the decision. Whether the money is actually appropriated by Congress, that's determined, I think, by a broad-based political movement. And I think if that sort of movement is created, I think way more than $4 million would be available. I saw someone over here. Thanks, Sarah. So a lot of your story had to do with an influx of money at the right time. And I'm not going to put my house in hawk to do those good things, much as I would desire the good things. Yeah. So, you know, for us folks who are just buying beans and rice, where do we go next? Well, fortunately, there are organizations out there that do this sort of work and take risks. And I, you know, I talked a lot about the Trust for Public Land. They took enormous risks. And they were going to pull out of the gorge had it not been for Nancy and Bruce loaning them money and then helping fundraise for them. But those organizations are around. Trust for Public Land is around. Columbia Land Trust is around. Friends of the Gorge Land Trust. You know, there, there are half a dozen to a dozen very qualified organizations whose mission is to go out and work with the community, identify the most important properties, and then do the fundraising themselves. So the Gorge, we were lucky because time and again, our backs were to the wall, and it took an infusion of capital from Nancy and Bruce Russell. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you can plan in advance, if you don't have subdivisions and factories flooding into the Western Gorge, which you don't have now because of the National Scenic Area Act, you can plan a little more. So I would encourage you to reach out to those organizations and help them identify the priority properties, and then they can take over raising the money. Okay, Bowen has generously offered to stay after and sign books out here, so there will be a chance to talk to him further, and I want to let you guys go who do have um, earlier bedtimes. Um, so I want to ask you one more question. Sure. And I'm going to let you think about it while I do a couple final things with them. So the question that I want to ask is, I heard something the other day, um, it was sort of, you know, a, a, a way of looking at the world, a way of looking at people, and this guy was saying, you know, my dad taught me that there are three types of people in the world. There's the type of people that when they get punched, they punch back. There's the type of people that when they get punched, they turn and run away. And then there's a third type of people. And the third type of person is the person that when they get punched, they look the person in the eye and they say, why did you do that? So one of the things that I've thought a lot about in coming to this night tonight and the Goldilocks story of the National Scenic Area Act is that there are a lot of people who probably felt like they got punched because it didn't go far enough or it went way too far or we weren't included in the table, we weren't at the table in the first place. And so you've got your environmentalists, you've got tribal entities, you've got local folks in Skamania. So how can we moving forward, Scenic Act version 2.0 or other similar things and be the, th and how can those, those powers that be like the Gorge Commission or the Forest Service or the National Park, how can they be more of that third person? So you think of that and I'm gonna do quick nuts and bolts here and then I'm gonna come back to you and you're gonna have an amazing answer to wrap <laughs> things up, okay? <laughs> so, well Bowen thinks, Next month, this is a fantastic segue because next month, if any of you guys have driven 84 or 14 in the last number of years, you may have noticed that there is something big happening at Mitchell Point. Mitchell Point tunnels, to some extent, in some new way, are returning. And we are going to have 
Uh, Kevin Price, who was the longtime, uh, I hope I get this right, regional director of the Columbia Gorge and is a fantastic historian and was there when the ribbon was cut at the Hatfield Trailhead and is going to tell us about the history of how we got to this point and what the trails were like prior to what they are now. So if you're new to the area, those tunnels used to exist and they're coming back. And then Kevin's going to be joined by Tova Peltz, who manages kajillions of dollars of projects for ODOT and is going to get nerdy with us about the geotechnical feat of magic that is going on to recreate and bring this iconic tunnel system back. So next month, join us because Kevin and Tova are going to be amazing. I also want to quickly thank Joe and John, our live stream team. Kyle Ramey right here, who's taking photos like a little photo ninja running around. I want to take, uh, thank CCA for having us. And Etta, who some of you guys met out front, she said it was really nice last month when I said, if you want to volunteer, talk to Etta. And she said, maybe I'd say that again. So if you want to volunteer, talk to Etta. There's a sheet out there. You can even volunteer for a specific lecture. And you get free tickets then. So just something to think about. Um, I think that is it book signing and book buying from Wacoma Books out in the hallway afterwards, local bookstore. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I, and thank you for everything. Oh, thank you. It. Thank you. <laughs> I know I asked the question, so I, but I yeah. feel like I should be out here with everyone else, so you just yeah. address us all, okay? <laughs> well, no thanks for your last question. <laughs> I, I, that's a, it's an incredibly difficult answer, and I was absorbed by the Mosher Twin Tunnels or the Mitchell Point Tunnel. <laughs> and so I, you know, I keep coming back to why Russell was successful. I mean, I spent years of my life watching her and, uh, and researching and writing about it. And what she always insisted on was that, and this is going to sound hopelessly naive, particularly in this day and age, is that the arguments be based in logic, that they be based in fact, that uh, you provide details, and that's the only way you're going to have a discussion and be able to meet somewhere in the middle. And what's the answer to that today? I mean, it's just maybe things changed uh, last night a little bit, but uh, I just, uh, we're, we're so polarized. We're not based, our discussions are not based in fact anymore that uh, I don't have a great answer to that. And I'm sorry that I don't, but I, I guess I keep coming back to, if, if you don't base your arguments in history, in facts, if you don't provide details, if you're not above board and have integrity, uh, how are you ever gonna reach agreement on these issues that so divide us? I will. I stand by that. I agree. I like. I appreciate you bringing some logic and fact here tonight. Um, and the only other thing that I would add is um, you have to listen yes. to other people. Good. And so thank you all for listening to Bowen tonight. And get the book and read it and spread the word about a little bit more of our history here in the Gorge. So thank you all, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was so hard. <laughs> That was difficult. Okay, so now we auction off your laptop. <laughs> and